my focus for my work is erosion sediment control. That's what I do most of the time. I do work in wetlands and permitting. Um, but so it's kind of, we're a little bit backwards today. Most of the talks you've heard today are, what are we getting at the end? This is what you're doing while you're doing it. Does anybody in the room deal with the North Dakota or federal uh, construction general permit? It's gonna be really boring for all of you then. Um, you, there are no charts. There are no numbers in my presentation, so it's a good way to just kind of just, you can zone out for the next 25 minutes and you'll be fine. Uh, engineers in the room, you might be able to keep up. Uh, um, I try to make that joke because I'm a biologist and studying to get an engineering degree. But, uh, um, so what I'm gonna talk to you today is basically the things that we expect to see while you're building these things. You're, you have a permit that says, all right, you're gonna put a pipeline in, you have to control erosion and sediment while you're building it. You, you can't just bring everything at the end. So, and it's not just, we're gonna put silt fence on the entire site, or we're gonna put the topsoil berm or the subsoil berm on both sides and leave it until, the, until we're done, push everything back in the hole and then stabilize it. We can't do that. Permits say we cannot do that. So I'm gonna go through some of the things that we talk about in our erosion and sediment control course. Uh, I know there's at least three people in this room that have taken the course with me. Um, sorry, you get to sit through it again. I guess it's your choice, you're in the room. Um, but so this is a very brief overview of the things that you need to look for while you're building a project. So some of the existing conditions. You need to understand your soils. Obviously we've talked about that a lot today. My focus on soils is not the horizons, things like that. It's more, what's that soil gonna do while you're in the construction? Are you gonna have a lot of sand? Are you gonna have dust issues? Are you gonna have a lot of clay? Are you gonna have track out issues? Are you gonna be moving material off your site? How is that gonna react? What's your topography on your site? Uh, it was said earlier in one of the presentations that we like to do one application of one thing through the entire job. Well, that's nice if your job is the same slope, same soil type, everything. But a lot of our, our projects, we don't have that. We have long linear projects that cross multiple waterways, across multiple different topographies. We, go, we have to know what those things are. And then what's your hydrology? What water do you have on your site? Where is it leaving? What's coming into your site? Um, this picture actually is a waste area that we had on a project. We had to cut a butte down off Highway 22. And you can see it kind of got away, away from us. I was the only one dumb enough to get close enough to take that picture. Uh, everybody else was like 100 yards away in the pickup. But So some of the other things we look for are outfalls and water bodies. Where's your site drain to? How close to disturbance gonna to be to where that's draining to? So what can you do in the meantime to protect that? Um, what protections are required? This is actually gonna be a lot bigger now. The federal permit just was just released for construction general permits that now says if you discharge to uh, your dewatering discharges to a tier one, two, two, two and a half, three, or um, other listed water body for sediment, suspended solids, things like that, you have to do benchmark testing. So you have to do daily testing now on those projects. That's a big thing for construction because we've never had to do that before. Um, so you need to understand where these sites draining to so you know what protections you might need. Um, I will try to get you out of here by four. So it's one reason why I'm talking really fast. Uh, if you don't, if I don't get you out of here by four, you can just walk out, I'm fine with that. Um, the other things considers your slopes. Like I said, we have long linear jobs. Those slopes change throughout the project. Um, this also will affect how, how soon you need to stabilize certain things. Uh, the permits in the state of North Dakota say that if your site, if, you're, if an area of your site is three to one or steeper, you have seven days to stabilize that once you're done in that area. If it's um, less than three to one, then it's 14 days. How close is that to the right away lines? So do you need to be working all the way up to the edge of that property boundary that you have a either a temporary construction easement or 
on our side, we generally follow our right away. So um, what can you do if you don't need to disturb it, then don't disturb it. Again, what's coming into the project? We had a lot of pro problems, especially here in town, when we were redoing 22, because when we were redoing 22, it was right through the heart of the boom and what else was going on? A lot of other construction activities were going on right next to our right of ways, which was then dumping material into us. So we had to figure out what are we gonna do to keep their material out of ours? Uh, where are your points of egress? So where's your track out issues gonna be? So if you come out onto a paved road surface, you have to clean that up every day. So we had to understand that. And then your impacts to or from the outside. Um, three really fast ways to get an inspection from either the EPA or the DEQ. Not control your dust, not control your track out, not control your trash. Because if people have dust or trash blowing into their yard, they're gonna complain. If they have to drive their shiny new car through your dirt, they're gonna complain. So those are the three things you gotta watch out for. The other thing is environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, if you work in a water body, especially in the state of North Dakota, you may have spawning restrictions. We do a lot of bridge work. We cannot work in certain water bodies between April 1st and June 15th. We're just not allowed. It's because of spawning and things like that, protecting the habitat. You cannot work on a bridge and not impact the water body. It doesn't happen. So you have to do it in a way that you minimize that impact. So a lot of our work, we have to put coffer dams in well ahead of that spawning restriction. Once that coffer dam is in, we can work inside that coffer dam, we're no longer in the river. So we can work inside that coffer dam during that spawning restriction. So that comes back to the phasing on how, they're, how you're gonna phase your project. Threatened and endangered species. Um, recently I've heard they're talking about listing a couple small minnows, chubs in the state of North Dakota. We haven't had to deal with that. We do have to deal with bats. We have to deal with piping plovers, uh, some of the butterflies. Um, we do have uh, those big white birds that taste like chicken, whooping crane. Um, we have those generally contractors, whenever I ask if you have a, a whooping crane problem or have you seen one, they just stare at their shoes. They've never seen one. I had one contractor that had three shotgun shells, empty shotgun shells at the outside of his, con his uh, construction trailer. And I asked him, I said, so I see you had a whooping crane problem. He's like, not anymore. <laughs> um, the other thing is cultural sites and avoidance areas. We have Aryanite issues in the state, things you don't want to be digging into. Uh, cultural sites, you don't want to be digging into those. You want to make sure that you're staying out of those things. So there might not be areas that you won't even get into that you may have to mark out on your project so you don't have that issue. Probably the biggest one, the biggest consideration is your phasing. This is the one that we, as a DOT, we let the contract control. And a vast majority of our projects is their phasing, is how are they gonna do that project? How are they gonna approach that project? But that's probably the biggest thing for erosion and sediment control. What's gonna be done first, and should that be the thing that's done first? For our projects, if you're working on a box culvert, does it make sense to do the box culvert in April or September? Most of the time in September because that box culvert's gonna be dry, especially on this side of the state. You don't wanna be working in water when it's flowing. If you can get in there when it's dry, that makes sense. But if you phase your job wrong, you're gonna run into a lot of problems. And then should things be required due to the nature of the work? Um, I was working on a project, I went up to review a project on the north side of Bismarck, where they were putting in a roundabout, because we have a, we love roundabouts right now. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but they're putting them everywhere. Um, there, they put one on 1804 north side of Bismarck and on the north end of Washington. And they were redoing a mile's worth of roadway just south of that roundabout. And that when I got there, they were working on that piece of road. They weren't, they hadn't touched the roundabout yet. They weren't doing anything. I reviewed their stormwater plan. In their stormwater plan, it specifically said that they're not gonna be doing any concrete work. Well, I don't know if you've driven on our roundabouts, they're all concrete. His roundabouts don't hold up if they're asphalt generally. So I knew there was something wrong. That SWIP should have said, yes, we will have concrete work. But their SWIP said, no, we don't have any concrete work on this project. 
This is a plan for a reason. They're supposed to be planning ahead for these things. They may not need to know exactly what they're gonna do with the concrete, but they need to be aware of that. And so you need to know what is going to be on that project from start to finish. For your erosion control, it's a big misconception, I guess. And actually this was something in my classes that I'm taking for uh, civil engineering. I had an intro to civil engineering course. It was a one credit class that they basically just give you the A to make you feel better for failing other classes. Um, but it was, the question in the book was, what is the most popular erosion control on a construction project? And according to the book, it was silt fence. Silt fence is not an erosion control. There are two different things on a project, erosion control and sediment control. Erosion control is keeping the dirt in place. That is the best line of defense that you have on a construction project. Keep the dirt where it's supposed to be. You don't want to be losing your topsoil. You don't want to be losing your material that you're trying to work with. So keep it where it's supposed to be. That may mean minimizing your disturbed area. As a DOT, we had a love affair with allowing a contractor to go right away to right away line and strip the entire project. And there were a couple of contractors when I first started 10 years ago, I could tell when I drove onto the project whose project it was. I didn't even have to look at the plan set because the entire 20 miles would be stripped and everybody would be working on the box culvert. And there wasn't a single thing on the project and we can't do that. Um, like I said, phasing the construction activity. That's probably the best way to do that is maintaining those materials so you don't have open areas. Controlling your stormwater flowing onto and through the project because if it goes into your project, it has to come out clean. You can't dirty the water as it goes through and let it leave your project. And then stabilizing those soils promptly and stabilizing your, and making sure you're protecting your slopes. Um, like I said, that comes back to that seven or 14 days. For your sediment control, that's your second line of defense. That is once that sediment is moving, once it's left where it's supposed to be, now you've got to catch it. So that's your silt fence. That's your fiber rolls. Those are the things that the water is going to have to flow through to drop that sediment out. Your storm drain inlet protections. I know a lot of you guys don't work in towns. We do. So we have to make sure we're protecting those storm drain inlets. Um, one thing, especially if you're anywhere near roadways, culverts, ditch bottoms, storm drains, those are all waters of the state. If you live in the state of North Dakota, the gutter on the side of your house is the water of the state. Based on the definition that the North Dakota state has, it is a conveyance of water inside the state of North Dakota, public or private. So you have to protect it as such. And we have to do the same thing. So all of our centerline pipes, all of our approach culverts, we have to protect those. Um, you want to maintain sediment on site, control your dewatering practices, establish your stabilized construction exits, and entrances, and then obviously you have to inspect and maintain. Everything you put in has to be inspected and maintained. Temporary or permanent cover, this is one thing, as we were sitting, as I was sitting here today, watching pictures of pipeline installations and things like that, I was kind of, you know, my, my head was itching because you see a, a pipeline and you see the dirt, and you don't see anything else. That's something that the permits do not allow. If a soil stockpile is sitting there for more than seven or 14 days, depending on how steep you stacked it, you have to stabilize it. We have to do the same thing on our projects. So if areas have temporarily permanently ceased activity, then we have to stabilize that. And it includes graded slopes, pond embankments, ditches, berm soil stockpiles. The only three things you won't have to stabilize are rock piles, concrete piles, or sand piles because they figure those are already stabilized. Everything else has to be stabilized within seven to 14 days. If you're on federal lands, it gets worse. Every, if you're over five acres, it goes to seven, out, seven days does, across the board. Doesn't matter what the slope is. So if you're on one of the tribal lands uh, and that's, or if you're in New Mexico, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, I think Idaho just got primacy, so they're no longer under EPA. But if you have any off-site accumulations, so if you have sediment that's left your site, you are required to go pick that up. Only time you're not 
required to pick it up is if the landowner says you're not allowed access. So you have to make sure that you go out and pick anything up. Um, when I was doing inspections in Missouri, we had some pipelines come through and it was a hard thing for some of the guys on the, on the projects to understand that they don't get the farm field on both sides. They get their easement. Their easement is your boundary. So if you go outside your easement, that is now an offsite accumulation. So if you stack your material on that easement line, anything that goes off of that is now a violation. You've actually violated your permit. So controlling that material is a big thing. You have to have a plan in place to clean this stuff up and your stormwater pollution prevention plan that you have for your project has to be modified because obviously you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. And then probably the last thing, and I know for a long time for the DOT it was the last thing that we ever did was final stabilization. You have to have a plan in place of how you're going to bring your site back to 70% of pre-existing vegetation. Um, there are three methods in the state of North Dakota the 70% of pre-existing vegetation, so you put the seed mulch in the ground that will get you to 70% vegetation and you wait until it gets there. Now that doesn't mean that it's 70% of the project. That means 100% of the project has been vegetated and it's 70% of the density of what it was to begin with. The other thing is bringing it back to the farmland use. If you have a borrow pit or something else in a crop field, You've got a contract with the, with the uh, farmer that allows you to go and get material. Once you put that back, you do not have to seed and mulch that. You put it back to the crop ground that it was and you're done. You don't have to go back to 70% of pre-existing. The last one is the air exemption or what I like to call the three year rule. This one is the one we use. It uh, basically says that if you're in an area of the state that is, gets less than 20 inches of rainfall annually, then you're allowed to terminate your permit if you've installed all the seed bed and mulch and permanent devices to get to 70% within three years without active maintenance. So you don't have to bring out equipment and fix something, basically. Our MOU with the DEQ allows us to use it on every part of the state. So. The vast majority of the state still falls under these, underneath this requirement. The only parts that don't are like the Red River Valley and there's a hole in Sargent County that gets more rain than everybody else. Don't know why. But those are the only areas you can't use this in. So I'll hear this rule applies. You don't have to get the 70% vegetation to terminate those permits. What we don't wanna see is what you see in this picture. We don't wanna see the black fabric flapping in the breeze in the grass. We've all seen it. Those are the two things, that's one of the two things that you should never see on the, at the end of a project is silk curtain and silk fence because those two things are never going to be permanent. How many times have you seen it? You drive by, see that yellow banana floating in the water? Yeah, it's not supposed to be there. You shouldn't have it in there. For the DOT, we figured out we needed a way to make sure that this was gonna happen on our projects, that everything that I just talked about was gonna get done. We had a permit for, I think the first permits were in the early 90s that came out. Um, the DOT, I don't think started getting them until the early 2000s. Uh, we're a little slow on the uptake, um, but we started getting permits, but we weren't really complying with them. And so we've developed a special revision that requires an erosion control supervisor. It has to be a con uh, employee of the prime contractor. So they can't say that a subcontractor is their erosion control supervisor. It provides that onus that yes, this is our job. Cause that was one of the main things that I would have an issue with when I came on a project when I first got here was it was always somebody else's problem. It is everyone's problem on our projects that Erosion control needs to be handled by everybody. But we wanted one point of contact with that prime to say, this is the person that's gonna handle erosion control on your job. They have to be familiar with the installation, maintenance, and removal of the erosion sediment control measures. 
the requirements of the SWIP, the plans, the permits, special provisions, specifications, uh, competent to supervise personnel, that's a hard one, um, and they have to be certified through our program. We require three people for the DOT on every DOT permitted project to be certified uh, through our program. Now that's the erosion control supervisor for the prime. If they have an erosion control sub, the supervisor for the sub, and then the project engineer. The reason for that is we wanted everybody to have the same information. We want everybody to be playing off the same playbook. So everybody understands this is the rules that you have to follow. The erosion control supervisor is supposed to be on site to provide the erosion, so erosion and sediment control measures and be on site to supervise their installation, maintenance, and removal. And we use ESCM instead of BMP. BMP is best management practice. ESCM is erosion and sediment control measure. Today's best management practice is tomorrow's piece of shit, basically. So there's no reason to use that term as far as I'm concerned. I will still screw it up. I still say BMP, but the erosion sediment control measures. Um, you need to update the SWIP. That person is the one that's gonna be updating the SWIP, the stormwater pollution prevention plan, both the narrative and the illustrative sections. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, proposed changes to the project engineer. They are required to be on site within 24 hours. The reason that's in there is because sometimes projects, they have multiple projects in a certain area. They want one person doing two or three jobs. That's fine, as long as they get to each job. And they are the ones that are gonna be submitting documentation to our project engineers. So that being said, I'll go through real quick the two main components of a stormwater plan. It's illustrative and the narrative sections. The illustrative section is the one that everybody likes to do, or well, if they have to do it, this is the one they're okay with doing. It's because they're, they're the pictures, they're the maps, it's the drawings, it's marking down on the map where you put something in, where you installed something. Um, a lot of this on our projects, we give them. We give them where we think they're gonna need certain things, whether it be fiber roll, silt fence, whatever, um, details of how they're supposed to be installed drawings of how it's supposed to be installed, that sort of thing. The hard part is the narrative section. The narrative section are the means and methods. That's where the contractor has to take it and say, this is what we're going to do on this project to make sure that this stuff happens. Um, and also the plan notes and the environmental commitments that we have already complied or said we we're gonna comply with through the term of that project. I've seen a lot of SWIPs. Um, in the past 15 years, um, they, there's a lot of issues with them. Um, not developing ones, probably the first one. You have to have it if you have a permit. Um, gotten a lot better with that. I've gone out to projects and they've handed me two pages and I hand it back to them. And um, it's, these are fairly large documents. They're not gonna be something really small. Um, Missing required sections, like I said before, if you know you're gonna have something, you need to have it in, in your SWIP. Uh, not having the maps and illustrations, so you show where everything is. Um, the ESCM is not designed to a two-year, 24-hour storm event. Uh, that one's gotten a little easier because the DEQ has finally come out and said, as long as you show that it's standard industry practice, then you're fine. Having a weak chain of responsibility section, the thing with a permit, it says is if you're doing something on a project and it's not clear in the SWIP whose responsibility it is, it's automatically everybody's responsibility on that project. So if you're controlling that project and you have a subcontractor that's doing something for you, you need to detail that out. So it explains this is who's responsible for this. Not being signed, as far as the EPA is concerned, if it wasn't signed, it doesn't exist. Uh, no, ins no inspection report, so they're not doing their inspections like they're supposed to be doing. And then a cookie cutter SWIP. And the way I like to explain a cookie cutter SWIP is basically regurgitating the permit. I've had people come to me and say, here's my SWIP for the project. I'm going to use it on every project we have. Can't do that. And generally what those SWIPs entail is somebody went in, to every requirement in the permit and rewrote the requirement to say, we're gonna do this. And so it doesn't say how they're gonna do it because that's what the SWIP is supposed to do on a project is explain how you're gonna meet those requirements. There is an art to writing these things. 
you have to be clear and concise and you don't want to avoid as needed when required because my as needed is going to be different than yours. You're going to come in and say, well, it needs to be required at this point. And I'm going to say, well, I think it should be different than that. So it needs to be specific, but not too specific. Um, I like to use the example of track out because everybody can visually understand that. And track out is when you bring material off your project onto a paved roadway. An example we see a lot is just what you see there. Track out will be cleaned up every day using a scoop shovel and a bucket. It's fairly straightforward, right? Fairly simple. It's going to be done every day using a scoop shovel and a bucket. Not hard. Then this happens. If you can't tell, this is Northwest Bismarck. Uh, you can see by the date in the corner, it's July 3rd. So what do you think is going to happen in this neighborhood tomorrow? A lot of barbecues, things like that. This is not my neighborhood. I do not make this much money. There's a lot of upset people now. This guy with the Ford is upset because he had to get his neighbor Chevy to pull him out of the driveway. Just, just angry people. So who do you think they called? They called the DEQ. This is actually a DEQ picture that uh, Dallas Grossman from the DEQ took. If you look really hard, you can see the guy with the scoop shovel. He's right there by that tree. If you look really, really hard, you can see his cell phone in his hand and he's calling his wife and saying he's coming home because he quits. Because he ain't doing this shit no more. <laughs> so, obviously, that's not going to work. Track out with a scoop shovel and a bucket, cleaning it up isn't going to work. The first major issue is why the hell did that happen in the first place? That should never have gotten to that point. Especially in an area where you're having to deal with those people. Um, so, what are some of the improvements we can make? Trackout pad. That'd be probably the first thing I would do to remedy the issue in, in the problem. Make sure you might have had one. Ever seen somebody drive around one? They do that all the time because they don't want to have to drive over it because it, it's shaky. Well, that's the point. But maybe that'll prevent that sediment from coming out. The next thing they need to do after they clean up the, the road and what they ended up using was a uh, snowplow to clean that up because there was no, no way scoop shell in a bucket was gonna work. They need to come back to this and say, what do we need to change in here? So maybe we don't wanna do it every day because what happens tomorrow when that's been fixed and there's no track out? Your SWIP says you're gonna do it every day. So you better have somebody out there with a scoop shell in a bucket every day. But you could say, we're gonna inspect it every day and if it's observed, we will clean it up. And maybe we have scoop shell with a bucket, we have a skid steer, we have a brush, we have some sort of broom equipment. Whatever you have on site, you could list out all of those things. Those are some of the things that you could do in your SWIP to say, and it covers everything, instead of nailing yourself down to just using a scoop shovel in the bucket. Now, like I said, there's an art to writing these things. The EPA has two example SWIPs. They're decent. I have never seen a SWIP I cannot poke a hole into because they're very subjective. Um, I will give you an example of something that comes from one of the EPA SWIPs. Um, I'm gonna read this, so just sit back and enjoy. The exits will be inspected weekly and after storm events or heavy use. The exits will be maintained in condition that will prevent tracking or flowing of sediment onto 6th Avenue. This could require adding additional crushed stone to the exit. All sediment track spilled, dropped, or washed onto 6th Avenue will be swept up immediately and hauled off site for disposal at Middletown Landfill. Sediment will be swept up from the anti-tracking pad at least weekly or more often if necessary. If excess sediment has clogged the pad, the exit will be top dressed with new crushed stone. The re replacement of the entire pad might be necessary when the pad becomes completely filled with sediment. The pad will be reshaped as needed for drainage and runoff control. Broken road pavement as a result of construction activities on roadways immediately adjacent to the project site will be repaired immediately. 
The stone anti-tracking pad will be removed before the subgrade of the pavement is applied to the parking lot. The removed stone and sediment from the pad will be hauled off site and disposed of the Middletown landfill. Now, that was a lot more words. I would argue that that is worse than the original statement that they had. Because if you read through this, we'll go back to the first part. Just some key points. All sediment tracks spilled, dropped, or washed onto 6th Avenue will be swept up immediately and hauled off site to, for disposal of Middletown Landfill. What does that say? That says you are going to watch the entirety of 6th Avenue from the, when it starts to when it begins. It doesn't say near your construction site. It doesn't say between these two blocks. It says the entirety of 6th Avenue. And at any time a piece of dirt drops on it, you're going to clean it up. And then where are you going to take it? You're going to take it to a landfill. What moron drives dirt to a landfill? I've never seen anybody that says, yeah, I'm going to haul my dirt to the landfill. That's, that sounds like a good plan. No, you're going to put it back on your site. Um, some of the other things... Sediment will be swept from the anti-tracking pad at least weekly or more often if necessary. When's it necessary? The, the I like this one. Broken road pavement as a result of construction activities on roadways immediately adjacent to the project site will be repaired immediately. Please define the word immediately for me. Because you've used it twice in the same sentence with two completely different definitions. So even if you put in the definition of the word immediately into your SWIP, you've got to define it twice now. And then try to figure out which one you're using. So again, there's an art to writing these things. And it's unfortunately, this is the document that no one wants to do on a project. But I'll tell you right now, these are the easiest violations to prove. Because I could take that document into a court of law and I can say you either did or did not do this. And if you have two sites, one right next to the other, both of them look the same, but there's been sediment discharged, and they can't tell which one did it, the guy with the better documentation is going to win, hands down, every time. Because he has something on paper that says, this is what I did.